Today, we come to another part of the lectures, and um, <clears throat> I want to uh, present you and go into some experimental details on magnetocalorics. Uh, we're talking about functionalities, <clears throat> particularly of, uh, of stoichiometric Hoislers functionalities at magnetostructural transitions. <clears throat> and as I told you, as we saw, that we have various functionalities. We have shape memory, magnetic shape memory, spin polarization, and among them we have the magnetocalorics. Now, before the magnetocalorics, I want to show you the elastic, elastocaloric video just once more, um, in the light of what you have learned, actually. And when you see this thing again, then um, you will probably recognize uh, the, uh, the nickel titanium. Now you know everything about it. So when you see this video in the future, you say, aha, I know what that is all about. Yeah. And bending here gives you the local strain, which causes this part of the wire to become martensite. Now you all know that, don't you? And then we go, so we have gone from one crystallographic to another crystallographic state, and the temperature increased, didn't it? And we let it loose, and the temperature went down to below the temperature that it started with. Okay? So, um, what does that mean? Uh, that means we have a heat pump. Okay? Now, um, if I were to, um, when we bend this, uh, we bend it very fast. Very fast means that we have uh, no um, heat exchange from the environment, almost, and we have, in a short period of time, an adiabatic process. So the temperature increases, but as we wait, of course, we're going to have heat exchange with the environment, and when we have heat exchange with the environment, the temperature will go down again. Now, while bending it, the temperature went up. And if we go back to, if we exchange, heat, exchange the heat until the temperature reaches uh, ambient temperature and then let loose, we can go down by the same amount that we have gone up. What was it? It was 19 degrees and it was 26 degrees, so it was a change of 9 degrees. So if I had let loose when this thing came back to room temperature, which was about 20 degrees, then we would have gone down to about 13, 14 degrees, yeah? So... Um, this is quite a large temperature change, and um, it is caused by this effect, which is a heat pump effect. So we're pumping heat from one source to, to another source, either increasing the temperature or decreasing the temperature. Now, I have here another video. It's not that good. I mean, I tried to... Uh, I do this rather quickly before I came here, um, where we can see the effect of the magnetocaloric effect. Now, as we applied a stress for the nickel titanium to change the structure from austenite to martensite, we have here a piece of gadolinium. Gadolinium has a Curie temperature right around room temperature, about 300 degrees or 300 Kelvin or something. And it has a very large magnetic moment, I think about seven more magnetons or something like that. So there is a very large change in the magnetization between the paramagnetic state and the ferromagnetic state. So if we sit at a temperature slightly above the Curie temperature in the paramagnetic state, and we apply a magnetic field, we can induce the moments to align, not the full ferromagnetism, of course, but we can induce a higher magnetic state, and thereby we will be changing the entropy again. In the beginning, in the paramagnetic phase, we have disorder. And we're applying the magnetic field, we're going to give order to the system. So the magnetic entropy is going to increase, and for that, I'll tell you later, that the lattice entropy will, uh, will, uh, will 
the magnetic entropy will decrease, the lattice entropy has to compensate that, it will increase, and uh, we'll have uh, a warming effect. Now let's see, there is a vise here and there's a piece of gadolinium here, okay? Now I'm going to come with my, uh, the temperature is about 300 degrees. Now I'm going to come with my hands holding two magnets and, uh, okay, I'm going to place the magnets around the gadolinium. And the, um, uh, the gadolinium is insulated so that it doesn't pick up heat from, the, uh, uh, from my hands or something. Now, as moment, uh, the, you see that we've applied a magnetic field and there's a thermocouple attached to it, which is a, uh, attached to this voltmeter. And uh, you see that the temperature is uh, steadily rising over here. This is, uh, okay, we applied the magnetic field and the, uh, the thermocouple is a little bit far from the uh, sample itself so that there is no immediate change, but you can see the temperature has already gone up uh, about two degrees or so. Now, um, and it's still going up. If I move away the magnet, then we have the opposite effect. It immediately goes down, and it's not an effect of my hands or anything like that. So this is um, what we uh, know as the magnetocaloric effect. Gadolinium is particularly a, um, a very good material. Um, it would have been very nice if it were abundant so that we could all have gadolinium refrigerators, but it's expensive. <laughs> it doesn't work. Uh, but um, people have built refrigerators. It does work. Uh, uh, the prototypes cost about uh, $500,000 or something like that, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Uh, but it works, and um, uh, I've been to several conferences, so the, uh, the, uh, the Thermite conference, and they brought it there. They have a working system. Uh, it looks like a refrigerator, and uh, they're very proud that they have cooled wine in it to a drinkable temperature. Yeah? <laughs> so, uh, now uh, we have the elastocaloric effect here. We have the magnetocaloric effect. Um, if we look at everything in more general, um, we can see that there is a lot of interplay between various parameters, various thermodynamic parameters. Now, um, we have on one hand the entropy and the temperature, okay? We have um, a magnetic field and we have the magnetization which is the conjugate parameter. We have a stress field and we have a strain. So we always have some kind of a field, okay? And um, so a stress induces a strain, a field induces a change in field, uh, causes a change in magnetism, change in entropy, causes a change in temperature. Now, these also can interplay. If you can move around, if you can induce a strain uh, over by applying a magnetic field, then you have shape memory properties, okay? This was moving twin boundaries in nickel manganese gallium and things. We, we were remaining in a, in a, uh, uh, in a martensitic state, applying a magnetic field, and we were causing a strain through the magnetization, of course. And um, <clears throat> what else do we have? We have field-induced transformations. We can also induce a strain by transforming the system from the martensite to the state to the austenite state by applying a magnetic field. These kinds of relationships over here um, lead to elastocaloric properties. We have a strain, and if we apply a strain, if we apply a stress, sorry, um, to a material, then we'll have an entropy change, and we'll get a uh, uh, warming or cooling, depending on wh what the system is. And then, um, of course, we have the, uh, uh, through the magnetism, 
uh, the application of a magnetic field to a magnetic material will cause the um, uh, it will cause an entropy change, and that will also cause a temperature change. So these are all linked to one another. Um, uh, the elastocaloric properties also include barocaloric properties because that is also an effect of pressure. By changing the volume, you change the uh, uh, the state of the system, leading to an entropy change as well. Now, um, but we are going to stick more to magnetocaloric effects. So, uh, what we should know is uh, how a refrigerator performs. A standard refrigerator, it's a gas compression refrigerator, okay? Um, we have food in a refrigerator, that's down here, okay? Um, <clears throat> so, and in our refrigerator we have a compressor. The compressor compresses the gas, it's the, the gas is all these chlorofluorohydrocarbons and things like that which are environmentally very unfriendly and that's why we're trying to switch everything to uh, magnetic cooling or elastic cooling. When the compressor compresses the gas, its temperature rises. So from one to two is an adiabatic process. The gas is compressed, the temperature increases, and then that comes to the condenser, which is the uh, um, the heat exchanger that you have behind your refrigerator, okay? So this warm <coughs> gas is then cooled back down to room temperature. So then we have compressed cool gas, which is then expanded. And um, I'll just say, so but for, uh, due to the Joule-Thompson effect, then you have a uh, cooling because of the expansion and the expansion is also sudden, so that it's an adiabatic process, so that the temperature drops down to room temperature and then uh, below room temperature. And your food, which is at warmer temperature, uh, does the heat exchange with the refrigerator itself, and the heat is expelled from the food. And the cycle goes on. Okay? Um, many of you may have seen this before, many not. I don't know, is, is this clear to everyone? Have you seen this before? Uh, just out of curiosity, especially the younger students. Have, have you seen this? Do you know these? Okay, good. So now, um, we have the um, uh, analog to this. We have the magnetic refrigeration. Compression means magnetic field, okay? So our magnetic field is actually our compressor in this sense. It replaces the compressor. So in the beginning, let's see what we have. We have a material. We have our magnetic caloric material. This is the magneto magnetocaloric material. Um, in the material, we assume that the spins are first disordered. So it's in some state, and we apply a magnetic field. When we apply a magnetic field, the spins align. It's difficult to see here in this figure, actually. The spins align, and when they have aligned, then the temperature of the whole material increases, first of all, because of the uh, entropy decrease in the magnetization. So, and then uh, through a heat exchange process, we bring the temperature of this aligned system back to its original temperature or to room temperature. And then we remove the magnetic field. When we remove the magnetic field, we disorder the spins so that we have an increase of entropy of the magnetic part which means that the lattice part has to decrease since the total entropy change has to remain a zero. And then we have our cooling. And then we have our food here. 
and that warms our system back up again, and the cycle proceeds. So this is magnetic refrigeration. <clears throat> now, um, magnetic refrigeration is not something new. It's something old, and it's always been used. It's always been used to attain very, very low temperatures in the microkelvin region, or the millikelvin region at least, with the, using the adiabatic um, demagnetization process. So uh, in this case, what is used at very low temperatures is a, some kind of a paramagnetic salt. This is one of them. Another one is cerium manganese nitrite. There are several of those, uh, depending on which is uh, efficient or not. What, why do we use a paramagnetic salt to attain low temperatures? And the reason for that is that we have um, a very strong change in the magnetization with decreasing temperature at very low temperatures. And it does not order. So the magnetization just keeps on increasing and increasing and increasing as you go lower and lower and lower in temperature. So you also have more room to change the magnetization. And when you change the magnetization by applying a magnetic field, you're going to have a temperature change. Warburg, in 1881, he first observed, reported the, uh, uh, the presence of a magnetocaloric effect uh, just by applying a magnetic field to a piece of iron. Okay? Uh, the temperature change was, of course, not that large, but uh, he saw the systematic um, change of the temperature when, um, where, when a magnetic field was applied to a regular piece of iron. Um, but it took many years uh, for Debye and Gioc to uh, use this effect to go down to very low uh, temperatures. Now, this is the actual, this is real data which I, uh, which I think got from one of these uh, literatures over there uh, on, uh, on this material. I plotted this out myself to see how it really goes and then it it just shoots up over here, okay? So now, um, let's look at the, uh, we're talking about entropy. <clears throat> the total entropy of a system is given by the lattice magnetic and electronic contributions. At least we, th we think that they are separable. Um, it's a thermodynamic relationship. It's, it's the additivity of, uh, of, of energies in particular, uh, in, in principle. This is valid, perhaps, only in the case when you are sitting in a single thermodynamic state, when the whole process is occurring within a single thermodynamic state. Now, when we have structural transitions, when we have field-induced transitions and things like that, this starts becoming problematic. Okay, we'll get back to that anyhow. So, for the case of the adiabatic demagnetization process at very low temperatures, this is okay. The entropy change in an adiabatic process, the total entropy change, when you go from one magnetic state to another magnetic state, um, has to be zero. This defines the adiabatic process. It, can, it cannot be anything else. So then if we plot the entropy versus the temperature, for the case when a magnetic field is zero, and for the case when the magnetic field is greater than zero, it would look something like this perhaps. This is very schematic, of course. So if we are sitting at temperature T1, and we apply a magnetic field, and since the adiabatic, uh, the, the process is adiabatic, this temperature change is going to be in this direction. It's going to take us from one curve to the other curve. So applying a magnetic field is going to give us warming. Okay? So this is, this is basically the magnetocaloric effect. Uh, then you have Carnot cycles and losses and things like that. That's, uh, that's another story, but this is what we have 
as the magnetocaloric effect, first of all. Now, in more generally, if we um, look at, if, if we want to determine entropy changes from the magnetization of so, then we have to know the relationships between the entropy change and the magnetizations. So these are some basic um, thermodynamic equations, uh, Maxwell's relationships, which tells us that the, <coughs> the field derivative of the entropy at constant temperature is the temperature dependent of the magnetization at constant field. Okay, this is, this is our starting point, so to speak, in this. You may have, in your courses, already derived such relationships as far as I know. So from here, then, if we want to calculate an entropy change, uh, we can integrate this. And yes, we get the entropy change. But we have data. OK? How do we integrate data? Now we have data. Uh, so we're not going to be able to integrate data, but we have to change that into summations. We have data that look like this, let's say. This is the field dependence of the magnetization at various temperatures. So let's say if we're at high temperature, it may look like this. At low temperature, it may look like this. And this is the uh, temperature interval. So. <clears throat> Um, when we look at it like that, then the entropy change is um, just the um, difference between consecutive uh, magnetizations, magnetization curves uh, integrated over the, uh, uh, the total field. When we're talking about entropy changes, we are talking about entropy changes with respect to a change in field. We can consider the entropy change from the, for this much field, we go from zero to this much field, or for zero to this much field, or zero to this much field, okay? So uh, whenever we talk about an entropy change, we also have to give the field value so that we know what the numbers mean and we know what we're comparing also. And eventually, of course, we come to the uh, case where we can estimate the entropy change directly from the, uh, from the curves. So basically, what we have as an entropy change from this equation is that we have two temperatures, two consecutive temperatures. So if we want to calculate the full entropy change, let's say, all the way up to uh, the maximum field, then um, this is just the difference between the area under this curve and the area under this curve. So this is the area that we are looking at over here, divided by the <coughs> change in the temperature. So we have an entropy change <coughs> experimentally. But what is the temperature? At what temperature do we ascribe this to? This one or this one? Uh, there's nothing we can do. So we just take an average temperature. Uh, this is the experimental way of looking at it. So uh, this is the entropy change for this difference. So we say this is delta S, the, what we calculated at the temperature, at the average value of these two temperatures. You can go further and you can do this all with the specific heat if you measure the specific heat. The temperature change is related um, to the specific heat and the, ma and the magnetization through these equations. Uh, you can take a look at these. I mean, uh, you will encounter them and perhaps do the formulas, and perhaps you've already uh, done it. But um, um, you can see here that, uh, in principle, um, the adiabatic temperature change is related to the specific heat and through these equations uh, to the entropy as well. So you can do two things. <clears throat> you can measure the magnetization, and you have delta S. 
Okay, you have delta S, but how much has my temperature changed? Okay, you can always have a delta S, but you don't know what uh, your temperature changed. So you have to know the specific heat. In principle, you have to know the temperature dependence of the specific heat under various magnetic fields. Uh, and nobody measures that. It's, uh, it's, it's not that easy. I mean, we have, people have done it and things, but it's not a, uh, it's not a routine measurement. Mm. You see here, you need C as a function of T and H. Sometimes you can say, okay, under H, my specific heat doesn't change that much. I'll just put a number over there, and you get an idea of what the temperature change may be, plus or minus 2 or 3 degrees or something like that. It is important to measure the temperature change, of course. But we have other methods to do that, and I'll come to that in a little while. So now, now we come to our Hoistlers, okay? Now, this was all very good. Uh, as long as you're in a single thermodynamic state, it's, it's not too bad. Uh, you can understand things. Even in gadolinium, you have a single structure. We think we have a single structure, not actually, but uh, when you cool from the paramagnetic state to the ferromagnetic state, assuming it's a full second order transition, there is not much change in the electronic structure so that, or the electronic properties. So that in a second order transition, you can basically use those equations as well. But what happens in gadolinium is that uh, nobody actually considers the fact that there is a large change in the volume when you go through the transition. So we always take it for granted that we say gadolinium has a second order transition. Uh, yes, it does indeed. From low temp when you start from low temperature and measure the magnetization as you go further up and up, the magnetization drops. But just before you come to the Curie temperature, there's a tremendous change in the uh, uh, in the structural properties. So it's interrupted with the first order transition, actually, but nobody knows, huh? Okay? <laughs> so keep this in mind, that with, at every second order transition that you can think of in iron, nickel, gadolinium, chromium, whatever you want, if you look at the thermal expansion data, that will always reveal a structural change. So all your second order transitions are always interrupted somehow with another first order transition. So uh, this, is a, this is a very critical point, because especially for people who have measured critical exponents and things like that. We don't know what they've measured. Yeah? So uh, it's uh, uh, because everybody thinks that it's a complete second order transition. There is no complete second order transition, not in the real world. So anyhow, we come here to magnetocaloric effects at first order transitions. Now, at first order transitions, we have one state and another state, and uh, we don't have thermodynamics anymore. Yeah? But we use thermodynamics. We can approximate things to a certain extent. So this is our nickel manganese indium, the data. Uh, now you are more perhaps aware of what you are seeing over here. It's not out of the blue anymore. Uh, we have our, the Curie temperature of the austenite state. Uh, we have the Martensitic transformation. For some reason or another, uh, it drops here. I haven't told you yet why. Okay, I'll tell you maybe. And then um, we have the blocking. We have frustration effects. We have all these things. And at the end, we get a curve like this, and we have intermartensitic transitions around here. Okay? Um, so uh, if we um, measure this not in a small field, this was measured in 20 Ersted in a very small field. If we measure this in 5 Tesla, um, uh, you see that uh, this is a zero field cooled and a field cooled. Uh, sorry, this is a field. field no, this is a zero field cooled, field cooled, field warming experiment, but the zero field cooled and the field warming that, uh, and the field cooled, they merge over here, so there is no splitting anymore because uh, you've uh, sort of uh, lifted the, uh, the, the frustration by the immense magnetic field that you have applied over there. But you still see the effect of the, uh, 
uh, of the field cooling uh, of the field cooling and the field warming, um, and the hysteresis that you have here at the transition. It's uh, much more clear here in when you apply uh, in, in large magnetic fields these uh, hysteresis and things. Now. Um, <clears throat> Um, at first order transitions, uh, look at anything, look at any system, any system with a first order transition is accompanied with a hysteresis. You have hysteresis because you have undercooling. You have undercooling and you have superheating or supercooling or superheating. And um, so the system gets stuck when it's being cooled in some um, but it's, it's been held by some barriers. It has to overcome some barriers before it can finally transform to the other state. But we have two, two areas over here. We have here on this side an increasing magnetization with decreasing field. And on this side, we have a decreasing magnetization with decreasing field. Okay? So um, we have two different kinds of change of the first derivative of the of DMDT, of the temperature dependence of the magnetization. It can be negative, it can be positive. And this has implications, of course, on the magnetocaloric effect. Now, <clears throat> the type of magnetocaloric effect that we have in these paramagnetic salts and uh, 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 paramagnetic to ferromagnetic transitions and things, we call them the conventional uh, magnetocaloric effect. It's because when we apply a field, they just warm. It's, you know, so that's, that's what we always knew as a uh, conventional magnetocaloric effect. But that's on this side over here. It also looks like the paramagnet at low temperature. On this side, if we apply a magnetic field, in the Martensite state, that will take us into the austenite state to a higher, um, magnetiz a higher magnetization state. But it takes us through um, a curve that has the opposite slope as this one. So in this case, we have the change in the, and change in the entropy, which depends on the sign of dmdt. And if the, DM, if the sign of DMDT is positive as here, then the change of entropy is positive. And in this case, in the conventional case, ah, oh, I made a spelling mistake here. Um, we have um, a negative DMDT. So now what happens to our logical way of thinking about magnetic entropy and lattice entropy and things like that. Now we have to be uh, a little bit more careful about things. So it is always true, whichever way you look at it, that the total entropy at any point uh, is going to be given as the total of the lattice magnetic and the electronic entropies. And if we have no transition, or if we have, let's say, approximately a second order transition where the low temperature magnetization is higher than the high temperature magnetization, uh, the change in the total entropy can be written as a sum of the change in the total entropies of each individual component here, and um, that will have to be zero. So, and um, what do we do? We consider that we don't have too much change in the electronic part of this, so the electronic entropy change is practically zero. So we have the balance between the lattice entropy change and the magnetic entropy change. Now, uh, what happens in the case of the inverse magnetocaloric effect? We cannot say anything in the beginning. We can only, uh, st uh, we can only start from the fact that, in the case of the inverse magnetocaloric effect, instead of warming, we observe cooling when we apply a magnetic field. That's all we know. Now, if we observe cooling, then with this logic, 
that we have over here, where we said that if the lattice entropy increases, it warms. Then we say, if we have cooling, we say, ah, the lattice entropy must have gone down. If the lattice entropy has gone down, then the magnetic entropy must have gone up. Now, there is no way of assuming that a, lattice, uh, that a magnetic entropy can increase when you apply a magnetic field. It won't work. Yeah? So the inverse magnetocaloric effect tells us directly that there's something wrong with these equations in the case of magnetostructural transitions, at all magnetostructural transitions. We don't see this when we look at the conventional magnetocaloric effect, when we look at first order transition, uh, when we look at uh, first order magnetostructural transitions from a low temperature high magnetization state to a high temperature low magnetization state. Okay? Um, if you were to have, um, there are some materials, uh, s um, magnetocaloric materials like what was this, lanthanum iron silicon and um, it was uh, uh, gadolinium silicon germanium and things which have transitions at around room temperature that looks like a ferromagnetic paramagnetic transition but it's not. It's ferromagnetic, it's interrupted with the first order transition, there's a little hysteresis, and then it's paramagnetic, okay? But what do we say? We say, okay, if the electronic part is negligible, we have the lattice part and the magnetic part. It looks like it, but it's not true. Because the inverse magnetocaloric effect shows us this direct experimentally. The fact that we have cooling on applying a magnetic field is the very fact that this equation cannot be valid because cooling in an external magnetic field would mean that your magnetic entropy had to go up and it cannot go up. So then what do we do? We can only consider the entropy change to be, to consist of a single term which is all intermingled with the lattice parts because you're applying a magnetic field, you're interacting with the lattice, you're interacting with the magnetization, you're changing the magnetization from one, one low state, one low magnetization to another state, you're changing the structure, and you have this entropy. So you can only consider the total entropy. It's an adiabatic process. It doesn't matter whether you have a, a phase transition or not. At the end, in an adiabatic process, the change in entropy is always zero. That is always true. That is always true, but uh, the other uh, ideas that we have used, the, the very simple ones, um, are not that valid uh, anymore. So, um, if the total entropy change, the total entropy change is this now. If this is less than zero, we have the conventional magnetocaloric effect. If it is greater than zero, we have the inverse magnetocaloric effect. Now, uh, before, oops, ah, there we are. Okay. At this point, um, since we're doing experiments, why don't we do a calculation? How we handle data? Um, if you want to measure the magnetocaloric effect. So I prepared some uh, dummy data here. Um, let me open that up for you, like this. So uh, this is just origin, okay? Um, a lot of you are familiar with this. It doesn't matter if you're not. Uh, in origin, you can make up your own data. You can even sell it. <laughs> so this is, I just put points over here. And um, what we have is here, we have a worksheet where we have the magnetic field as the, <coughs> um, as the X value, and then we have the magnetization at various temperatures given by some numbers like this, okay? Then what you simply do in your origin is that you have to calculate the areas lying between consecutive curves up to whatever field you want. So just as an example, I did this 
for a um, to calculate the temperature change at 35 Kelvin. 35 Kelvin means that, okay, you have to calculate the area under this, you calculate the area under this, you subtract the two, and you divide it by the temperature difference, which in this case is just taken as 10 Kelvin, and um, origin has nice functions where you just say integrate, it integrates, and it gives you the area, and all you have to do is subtract it, divide it by 10, and you get a value, okay? So this is how you do it uh, when you're doing the experiment. You do your MH curves, and at the end you start, you, you play around with them. Is this okay? Any questions? Do you have any questions at all up till now? None? Okay. So, let's go back to our PowerPoint. There we go. And we go back to our Poisler now. So we have the inverse, the conventional, and we have the subtleties associated with the uh, inverse magnetocaloric effect. Now, we, now we come to real systems where we don't make up the data, we measure the data. Um, we we'll see here what kind of data we have to take to be able to make such measurements. We take this system again. It seems to be that I'm always pretending this system. There are many other things you can take, but I mean, this is more or less, it seems to be more or less a prototype at the moment. So again, we have this kind of a curve and then what we do is we sit at a temperature somewhere around the martin zittig transformation temperature and we take these kinds of M versus H curves. Now there are some things that you have to consider when you're taking these uh, magnetization isotherms. So here's a measurement at 140 Kelvin, 144, it goes on four Kelvin steps. Each time before you take any one of these measurements to be consistent and to be sure of the initial uh, conditions, you always have to take your sample to a low temperature, let's say here about 50 Kelvin or something like that, where we see that we are in a pure uh, martensite state so that we know what the initial state is and we know where we're coming from because we have hysteresis around the transition. So we just cannot increase the temperature and measure the magnetization. It doesn't work uh, because it's, uh, 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 when we go to the, the, the path you follow is very important. In this case, um, when you're uh, measuring and presenting the data of your um, entropy change. So you have to express, you have to say, whether you have taken this consecutively without going down to low temperature first and measuring, or whether you have gone down to low temperature and gone to the measurement temperature afterwards. So in this case, um, the data were taken by going to a temperature well in the Martensite state, and then up to a given temperature, and then uh, the, uh, uh, the magnetization isotherms were taken. Usually, when you are measuring, um, so when you're doing such measurements, um, you have to be uh, careful about the temperature intervals that you're selecting because at the end, you are going to be uh, determining areas between two curves that lie with a certain um, temperature difference. Now, if this temperature difference is small, your accuracy increases. Um, but if it's too small, then it takes uh, years to complete the experiment. So you have to sort of uh, compromise on your time and on the um, uh, on the um, uh, 
a temper on selecting a temperature interval that will be appropriate for calculating the entropy change. So in this case, we take a delta T of about 4 Kelvin. Depending on what you want, you can take it 2. But more than 4 Kelvin usually doesn't give you those, uh, those good, um, good results in that sense. So, and then uh, what you do is you go and calculate the entropy change. This data belongs to this. This is for another sample, which I'm not showing here. It's, it's, uh, it's a sample with a little bit of gallium in it, uh, just to see uh, what the effects are. I won't go into that. So what do we see here? We have an entropy change, which is positive up to around this temperature, and then it becomes negative, OK? That's because this temperature, 300 Kelvin, corresponds around to the Curie temperature of the austenite state. And this peak around here, what is that? It's about 200 something Kelvin. And that seems to correspond to the Martensite start or austenite finish temperatures around there. And we get their maximum at around those temperatures. It's quite interesting here that you have an entropy change in this direction um, of a certain value. And the, in the other direction, well, that's uh, also not too bad. So in both directions, in this particular material, you can observe the inverse magnetocaloric effect as well as the conventional magnetocaloric effect. It can show you both depending on which temperature range you are. Now, um, the next thing that I would like to go into eventually is the adiabatic temperature change measurements directly. Now, we have entropy change measurements, but we don't know what the temperature changes. Entropy change measurements, when they're large and things like that, it's all very, it's very impressive. We, have, we say we have large entropy changes. We, we say it's a good magnetocaloric material, a bad magnetocaloric material. Uh, but just by looking at the entropy change does not tell us everything. We have to know what the temperature is doing. We have to know what the hysteresis are doing. So in the next part of the lecture, I think I'll go into that, the adiabatic temperature changes and the hysteresis. So I think it would be a good time to give a break now, yeah? Somebody wanted me to uh, repeat this uh, graph over here, what we have. Um, this, is, this is just a magnetization. I mean, there's uh, nothing special about this, except it's that uh, it's shown in, uh, for a low temperature, a uh, low field measurement and a high field measurement. And um, yes, the drop in the magnetization on this side over here is caused by some magnetic interactions. There are antiferromagnetic anti entities in there. I haven't shown you yet uh, the, uh, the results of experiments that show that there are antiferromagnetic uh, entities in there. But OK, anyhow, you have a drop in the magnetization. And you have a slope which is, um, which is positive. And the slope, this is the slope. This is the MDT. So the sign of the MDT determines whether it's going to be an inverse magnetocaloric effect or a conventional magnetocaloric effect. In this case, the slope is negative. Okay. Now, the inverse magnetocaloric effect is experienced. We didn't predict it. We applied a magnetic field. Ah, we saw cooling. Okay because our normal senses tell us that when you apply a magnetic field to a magnetic system, it should warm, yeah? But this doesn't warm, it cools. So then we have to think of why it cools. And the inverse magnetocaloric effect is therefore the observation of the cooling tells us directly that the classical additivity of the different components is, does not work 
when you are at a transition, because at a transition you're not at, uh, at a fixed thermodynamical state. You're in mixed states, you're going from one state to another state. You have hysteresis here. What do we mean by hysteresis? Yesterday there were some questions concerning that. What is the sample here? Okay, here we have the Martin's at start temperature, let's say here. And here's finish. What's this in between? It's all mixed. It's mixed austenite and, and martensite. Okay? And we're, we're applying a field, we're applying a field to both. And so there are all sorts of things happening. The field is interacting with the lattice through the magnetization. That is true, because if we didn't have magnetic moment, then the field wouldn't do anything. It has to have the magnetic moment. So for changing the structure, we're changing it through the magnetic moment. Is this okay? Yeah? We can discuss this again further on. So now I wanted to come to the point where we um, will talk about direct adiabatic temperature change measurements. Yes, if you have measured the entropy, um, uh, measuring the entropy is quite quick. Uh, you put it into your magnetometer and you can measure um, an isotherm in many cases in a matter of minutes, uh, sometimes in a matter of half an hour or something like that, depending on your magnetometer. So uh, to obtain such uh, data, even in the slowest measurements, it takes about overnight. You program it in measurements, it in measures. If you're using a vibrating sample magnetometer, then it's much faster. It's a matter of a few hours, and then you have your, your data. But that's only the measurement, of course. Then you have to, after each measurement, you have to bring it down to a low temperature. Changing the temperature takes time. Take it back up again, and you do a quick measurement again. So anyhow, from there, it is possible, as we see, to determine the entropy change. And the entropy change gives us a good idea of uh, whether the system may have good magnetocaloric properties or not, or may. We don't know if it is good because we have other parameters. We have the hysteresis problem, okay? So now, uh, how do you measure adiabatic temperature change? Warburg did that in 1881. He took a magnet and he placed it on the material and the temperature changed. And this is exactly what we do, except in a little bit more sophisticated manner where we sort of ensure uh, more or less that there are adiabatic conditions present. So basically we have a, um, uh, a, a calorie meter uh, or a magnetocalorimeter, whichever, it doesn't matter, it's just a calorie meter. We have our sample here in the middle. It's hung with threads on a copper frame there's a heater here. There's a thermometer here, which is a diode thermometer. And there is a thermocouple here, which is attached directly to the sample. It's, it's embedded in the sample, so you're measuring the temperature of the sample itself. Of course, it has to be a thin thermocouple, so the thermocouple doesn't carry away the heat and things. So, and this is in a chamber which can be either filled with helium exchange gas or it can be evacuated depending on how you're carrying out the experiment. And then we have another chamber here and this chamber can also be evacuated or filled with helium. These are chambers where you play around with the, uh, uh, the pressure of whatever's in there. And if you want gas in there, you usually put in helium because helium has a high thermal conductivity. And all around here is the inner part of the cryostat. And in the inner part of the cryostat, what you have is you have a helium bath out here. The helium comes through here. It's temperature controlled helium gas flow. So you set the temperature to approximately the temperature that you want. And you do your fine control over this diode and the heater here so you know exactly what the temperature of this frame is and if you put an exchange gas in here then through the um, conduction with the exchange gas your sample approaches the temperature of your frame. Once you've done that you have to pump out everything. You want adiabatic conditions. You don't want anything uh, around your sample 
um, that is uh, uh, thermally conductive, so you don't want to lose heat. So what you do is, uh, once you have reached the temperature, reached the measuring temperature that you want, you pump out any exchange gas that you may have introduced in here and from here also, so that your sample is now hanging in vacuum. It's uh, in a more or less ideal um, adiabatic state. So then um, outside here we have our magnet. It's a solenoid. It surrounds the whole thing. And then you apply your magnetic field. Okay, it's a superconducting magnet, the one that we had. In some cases, you may have electromagnets. In some cases, you may have pulse magnets. And that changes the speed of which you apply your magnetic field. And that also has effects on the transition properties as well. But anyhow, uh, we're in the simple case where we're just uh, sweeping the field, let's say. So we have this data. And then we have the, uh, uh, th this is what I just showed you. This is the entropy change, which we determined from the magnetization. Uh, there was a question uh, concerning the uh, entropy change. How do we measure the entropy change? Uh, I just want to say that we don't measure the entropy change. We determine the entropy change from the equations. We measure the magnetization, okay? So the entropy change is not a measured quantity. It's a calculated quantity from the data. Uh -huh. So now, um, we hung our sample uh, in our calorimeter. We've applied a magnetic field. And uh, what do we see? We see temperature changes. This is our direct temperature change measurement. So what has happened now? We, down here at low temperatures, below around 200 Kelvin or so, that's in this region, we have the inverse magnetocaloric effect. We applied the magnetic field and it cooled. Okay, so we, we observe the cooling directly and we measure the cooling directly. When we go to the other side of the curve, when we apply the magnetic field, it warms. We have um, the conventional magnetocaloric effect. Conventional in the sense that, okay, it's not like a paramagnet, it's still a magnetostructural transition. Uh, it's, it's a uh, transition from a ferromagnetic to a paramagnetic state. But anyhow, I mean, it's the, in the sense, it's conventional in the sense that when you apply a magnetic field, it warms. And you see that directly over here. So, and these two, you see, they um, correspond to one another very nicely. You have the positive entropy change, which corresponds to an inverse magnetocaloric effect. And then you have the negative entropy change which corresponds to the positive change, uh, to a uh, <clears throat> positive temperature change. And they peak close to regions where you have a maximum change uh, of the magnetization with respect to temperature. It's, uh, I mean, you expect that because, I mean, delta S is dm dt. It's proportional to dm dt. It's proportional to the slope. So the higher the slope, the larger is the entropy change. Okay. Also, uh, when the difference in the magnetization is large, then of course dm dt is also large. So it's not only the slope, but it's the magnetization itself, or the magnetization change, which also should be large. This is all okay. We applied a magnetic field. We saw a change. So what happens when we remove the magnetic field and apply the magnetic field again? Do we see the same change? As long as you have hysteresis, you never see the same change. So um, you'll always see, you'll find in literature, values given for entropy changes, values given for temperature changes, but it's always the first shot, okay? They never show you the second one. They show you the best part of your data, of the data, yeah? Because because of the hysteresis effects, you have losses. And you're going to start uh, losing these beautiful large values that you see. 
and publish, <laughs> and uh, you impress everybody. But that's not the, re uh, the reality of the whole thing. Yeah? OK, the reality is actually more bitter. So um, this means that um, we cannot use every material that shows a large magnetocaloric effect as a magnetocaloric material because, OK, you apply your field, you get this tremendous entropy change, but you apply it a second time, nothing happens, OK, because of the hysteresis. So this means that we have to deal with hysteresis. We have to try to understand hysteresis. We have to understand how to live with hysteresis. And if possible, we have to understand how we want to control hysteresis. Now, we, to begin with the problem of hysteresis, we take two prototype systems, one with a large hysteresis and one with a small hysteresis. And we look at the entropy changes and the, and the, or the temperature changes better. Um, of these two systems, what happens when we apply magnetic fields back and forth in these systems? So uh, the examples which I want to show you are related to, it's another indium-16 sample, it's probably another sample that we used, and tin-16. So what you see over here, you find two different widths of the hysteresis. In indium, you have a hysteresis width of about 14 Kelvin. Uh, you can measure it almost anywhere you want. It's just that width. And in the case of nickel manganese tin, it's much broader. It's about 30 Kelvin. So if we take these and we do experiments on temperature change, what do we see? So now what we're doing is we're not making a single shot experiment. We're making a double shot experiment. We're just going up with the magnetic field and then we're going back down again, okay? <clears throat> so this is, it's a slightly different sample, but it doesn't matter um, for, um, that was for, for, for some experimental purposes. We had to use another sample because the first one we didn't have available, uh, enough material or whatever. Anyhow, so, um, if you take nickel manganese indium and you go down to a temperature called the initial temperature where you are in a pure martensitic state, okay, and then you go to a measuring temperature, let's say here to 260 Kelvin, and you apply your magnetic field, you get this data. So, the initial temperature is always the well-defined state temperature, in this case, the Martin side. So you do this. You go to 180, you come here. You go to 180, you come here, and so on and so forth, until you come to the region where the applied magnetic field starts to call, uh, cause cooling. That would be a region somewhere around here, perhaps. Um, since this is a slightly different sample, it's shifted a little bit, but I mean, this point, this would correspond to a state which is somewhere around here. So you, what you do is, let's take this point for example, you apply a magnetic field, you get cooling, which is about minus one Kelvin, and then you go, after you've waited for some time, you go from five to zero, and you see that you don't get the one Kelvin back, it gets stuck at about 0 0.8 Kelvin, let's say. So you're not getting back what you put in. If you go to the maximum over here, you have a maximum about two Kelvin over here, but this maximum over here is about 1.2 Kelvin. So initially when you have applied a magnetic field, and when you were in a state over here or somewhere, uh, you had a large temperature change, um, and if you, if you had no hysteresis, then you would have recovered this temperature change after waiting a long time, and this would have come up here, okay? But it doesn't. 
when you're going from the uh, martensite state to the austenite state by applying a magnetic field. Isn't that what this is? It, you apply a magnetic field and you go from the austenite state to the martensite state. This is the path that you take. You take the lower path, okay? Um, so the, martens, uh, the austenite to martensite transition, the MS temperature is here. This is measured when you're going down. When you're going up, you're going up like this. You cannot go up here, and you cannot go down here, okay? You have to be on the right path to be able to change the state of the system. Changing the state of the system means changing the amount, relative amount of austenite and martensite when you are in that hysteresis. So when we are going down to 100 Kelvin, We're putting the thing in the martensite state, and then we're increasing the temperature. When we're increasing the temperature, we're on this lower path. And when we apply a magnetic field, then we're going upwards here, okay? But then, when we're removing the magnetic field, we can't go back down. We have to cross the hysteresis, and then we can go back down. Because it's only going up and going down through these paths is a part that gives us the inverse magnetocaloric effect, okay? You have to change the state of the system. If you're sitting here and you go, you don't change the state of the system. Now, if you do the same kind of experiment for a system that has a larger hysteresis, a Nicomagetes tin, you do the same kind of experiment. You go down to a temperature which is low enough so that everything's in the martensite state and then you come to the measuring temperature. To nickel manganese tin, you apply a magnetic field, you get this huge temperature change of almost three Kelvin, it's about 2.6, 2.8 Kelvin or something. It's even more than this. And you're very impressed. You publish your papers and everything, you said, I've got it, yeah? Ah, but you remove the magnetic field and you've got nothing, yeah? It's gone. So what has happened? You're stuck in the hysteresis. You're not, be, you're, you, you, you're not able to change the state of the system. So that you, if you're not changing the state of the system, you're not changing the entropy that much, and you're not getting anything. So um, you can see all along over here, um, the system gets stuck. Well, there's a little bit of an inverse, uh, no, this is not the inverse actually. You see, for the inverse magnetocaloric effect, if you, when you remove your field, this has to be a positive change. Here you remove your field, it's a negative change. So you're stuck in a system where the state of the system doesn't change, it behaves just like a regular ferromagnet, and in a regular ferromagnet, when you remove the field, it's adiabatic demagnetization and it cools. So when you remove the field, it doesn't warm anymore. It, it just cools, cools a little bit further, but it gets stuck there. And so each time you go to low temperature, you go to another measuring temperature, and so on and so forth, and then you come to the point uh, where you are in the austenite state, and in the austenite state, uh, then uh, you have the conventional magnetocaloric effect because it's just a ferromagnetic state. You're applying a magnetic field to a to a ferromagnet, and when you're removing it, it's cooling it. So everything up here is, is normal, but as long as you're here, um, this is a very nice one-shot material, but you cannot use it as a caloric material. So what is happening in, these, in the region of all these hysteresis and things? Now here's our, both of our systems here again. Um, we are follow, running some loops. So we've measured on decreasing temperature, we've gone down somewhere, came back up again, and these open circles, they're just the regular loop. And then you can do, you can play around with your measurements. So if you, you go down here, and then suddenly you decide not to go down any further, but you decide to increase the temperature. And you see here, uh, first nothing happens. You have to cross this martensitic transition temperature. You go up here, and then it goes into the other state. 
And then when you go back down, it goes back down. And then when you come back up again here, here's, there's a path that in, uh, remains entirely within the hysteresis. So you go up, you stop here, you go back, it doesn't go there, it goes here, comes back here, you go up further, what does it do here? Uh, it makes a little loop here, you can go up again, there's one over here, and then um, you go back down in lower temperature, the, more, the, the moment that you cross the martin zittig transition temperature, something happens and then you go back up again. So there are various paths that you can follow by um, changing the um, uh, temperature um, within the hysteresis. In the case of nickel manganese tin, you see here, you can change the magnetization. Changing the magnetization means that you're changing the state of the system. But here in nickel manganese tin, what is happening? You're going up here, you're going back and forth here. You see, nothing is happening here. This is, this is, it gets stuck in one single state. And if you're stuck in one single state, you have something like a ferromagnet and you get the conventional magnetokaloric effect. It's only when you go up this hysteresis, then you're changing the state of the system and it's giving you rise to a temperature change. So you do this and this. Um, if you go to some temperature around here, uh, like this blue one, and then, uh, and then go all the way back down again, okay, um, uh, you have to reduce the field very much in order to be able to see anything. But in most cases, in very many cases, what you do is you get stuck in the hysteresis. So when you measure now, we're not just measuring just up and down, but we're measuring up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. We're cycling the thing. And from the cycling, because the refrigerator cycles, and we have to know what the magnetocaloric material is doing when we are cycling these things. Is it operating properly? So this is the adiabatic temperature change that we measure in our calorie meter. We wait for some time to check the drifts in our calorie meter, okay? This is a standard that you do. But this is about 10 minutes, I think. And then you apply your magnetic field. And when you've applied your magnetic field, you get an initial temperature change of about 1.4 Kelvin uh, when you are at these temperatures. So, and then you wait again. Um, these are all non-adiabatic conditions uh, that prevail in your calorie meter. Um, I mean, even if you had the most perfect conditions, if you had most perfect conditions, these would all run flat, but they don't. So you come to, you wait, uh, I think at about another 10 minutes or something like that, and then you remove your magnetic field. And when you've removed your magnetic field, you come to this point, and you wait, you apply a magnetic field. You wait, you remove your field. Uh, apply a field, you remove your field, you apply a field, you remove your field. And you see here that, well, within a certain temperature range, the temperature differences around here are about 0 0.7 Kelvin. So your initial shot was 1.4 Kelvin. Your subsequent shots are all 0 0.7 Kelvin. Well, this is not too bad. This means that maybe we have a chance to live with hysteresis. If our subsequent shots show a large enough temperature change. So we have to find materials, we have to look for materials. That's another story. But this tells us that, yes, it is possible to live with hysteresis. The other one's a mess, okay? Okay, here's our initial shot, 2.5 Kelvin, and then um, it becomes, it, cools and warms, it does all sorts of stuff, uh, and uh, there is nothing consistent. I mean, if you really try to estimate what you're having around here, uh, it goes from 2.5 to 0 0.4 Kelvin in some cases, but it's, it's useless, okay? Although the initial entropy change is huge. So, um, we didn't know this before, of course. We also presented our best data um, and in the days that we didn't have our calorie meter, we also 
um, uh, measured the uh, uh, the magnetization from the magnetization curves. We 